The year was 2000 and female artists were taking over the charts. In the spring of that year, a new singer emerged, and her tomboy style, bright hair, and raspy voice took everyone by surprise. Alicia Moore was introduced to the world as Pink, LaFace Records' newest musical sensation. To some, she appeared to be biracial, and the media and her record label were more than happy to push her into a box of racial ambiguity. Even Vibe magazine described her as a soulful vanilla child. And as she shimmied across our TV screens with her hot pink, let me speak to your manager haircut, many people were quick to give her a lifetime pass to the cookout. But following the release of her debut album, things began to change. Pink abandoned the bling-bling hip-hop persona that made her so popular and embraced rock and punk music. The swift change left many people wondering, were we hoodwinked? Was she only singing R&B music for commercial gain and media attention? Or was Pink simply a puppet in an industry that loves to make a blue-eyed soul singer the face of R&B music? Let's discuss. Juicy, tender, and packed with so much flavor. Check out our new selection of brisket beef jerky, available in lemon pepper, smoky Texas barbecue, volcanic jalapeno, and more. Visit rrgsnacks.com to purchase a bag, or two, or three. Pink told The Guardian she hung out with black children in her early teenage years because white children didn't like her. She developed an eclectic taste for music and gravitated towards punk bands and hip-hop groups. She performed at a Philly nightclub, and her rendition of a Mary J. Blige song won over the dominantly black crowd. With a childhood marred by a broken home and substance issues, she dropped out of school and put all her focus on escaping Pennsylvania. She told The Guardian her initial plan was to hitchhike to California and sing on Venice Beach until she got discovered by a record label. But life had other things in store. She joined an R&B group called Basic Instinct, and during a chat with Interview Magazine, she claimed she was kicked out of the group, quote, because they were black and I was white. By the age of 15, she and two other white girls formed a group called Choice. They recorded a song called Key to My Heart, which caught the attention of LaFace Records co-founder L.A. Reid. He invited them to Atlanta and signed them on the spot. The group was initially marketed as a white trio singing black R&B music, and they worked hard to put the finishing touches on the album. However, the record got shelved, and after the group's disastrous performance at LaFace Records' annual holiday party, the group got put on the back burner. L.A. wasn't going to give up on Pink, though. He saw something in her. He told The Guardian, When I first met her, she was sweet, charming, amazing, talented, and gifted. I couldn't take my eyes off her. Because she was already signed under a pre-existing contract as a member of Choice, Pink told Variety that L.A. couldn't legally tell her to go solo. So instead, behind the scenes, Pink said he simply told her, If you don't go solo, I'm never going to support you. However, it has to be your idea. So, she left her group members in the dust. Pink negotiated a solo contract on her own and asked L.A. to throw in a $300 catsuit to seal the deal. Pink later stated that after hiring a new manager, she had to renegotiate her contract because it wasn't the most favorable deal. As she worked on her first album, she told The Guardian that it was all about marketing. She wasn't making the kind of music she loved. She was making cliché songs that would appeal to consumers. When Can't Take Me Home was released in 2000, it had all the makings of a classic R&B album. With some help from Babyface and Candy Burris, who were both instrumental in bringing the music to life, Pink's album went double platinum and resulted in three top ten singles, including There You Go, Most Girls, and You Make Me Sick. Her music videos featured Pink in outfits that looked like they came straight from a Dr. J's clothing store, and her love interests were typically men of color. And then came the cornrows. And the locks. People were so convinced that Pink's extra seasoning had to have come from an undisclosed black ancestry. 
I mean, there's a poll going on, like a bet going on at my friend's work. They think my mom lied to me about who my dad is. Like, they, they totally think I'm mixed. I'm like, whatever. Like, I'm a mutt. We all are. We all came from the same place, God. From there, she contributed to the Moulin Rouge soundtrack on the song Lady Marmalade, alongside Christina Aguilera, Maya, Lil' Kim, and Missy Elliott. The song was a number one hit and earned Pink her first Grammy Award. Even with all of her success in the R&B world, Pink didn't always feel welcomed. She told Rolling Stone, I'll walk into a black radio station and know, just from the vibe in the room, that they don't want me there. It's something that always affected me, and I hate it. Did she hate it enough to switch up her style and make music that would make her feel more accepted? As she headed back to the studio to record her second album, her label wanted her to follow the same formula. But Pink rebelled and decided to embrace the style of music that her heart was drawn to. She had always been a huge fan of 80s grunge rock band Four Non Blondes and the lead singer Linda Perry. Pink found Linda's phone number in her makeup artist address book and decided to give Linda a call. When Pink's label heard about her intention to work with the rock star, they were confused and told her it was a terrible idea. L.A. was particularly unenthusiastic about Pink's new direction. And can you blame him? She was venturing off of the predetermined, money-making path he had created for her. As for Linda, she told Rolling Stone she thought Pink had the wrong number. Linda said she couldn't understand why Pink, who she described as a bling-bling girl, wanted to work with her. Once Pink told her she was a huge fan of hers, Linda invited Pink to her studio, and their song, Get the Party Started, turned into a smash hit. Pink's other pop rock songs, including Just Like a Pill, Family Portrait, and Don't Let Me Get Me, were also included on her multi-platinum sophomore album entitled Misunderstood. Even though legendary R&B producer Dallas Austin was also involved in the project and produced the majority of the album, the change in Pink's sound was clear. She admitted to the Baltimore Sun that some listeners might not be happy with her new sound, and she was aware that some might think she only recorded R&B music on her first album for commercial gain. But Pink wasn't phased by the criticism. She stated, I just created something musical to open people's minds. I made something eclectic. All of a sudden, Pink was no longer the soulful diva. Spin Magazine put her on their May 2002 cover with a headline, Rock's Nasty Girl. As she was questioned about her new style, Pink reminded her fans that she's always been a fan of various types of music. She told MTV that as a child, she sang in a rock band and an all-black gospel choir. She added, I didn't believe there were any boundaries, and I still don't. For her third album, she and Linda Perry created more pop rock songs, with some additional help from Tim Armstrong of punk band Rancid. When Pink presented the finished album to L.A., he wasn't pleased. According to The Guardian, he still had it in his mind that Pink was his R&B superstar, and he didn't want her to further alienate her original fan base. But he was willing to give the album a chance. Try This was released in 2003. Although the song Trouble earned her a Grammy for Best Female Rock Vocal Performance, the album was a disappointment. Pink released a few more albums through LaFace and its parent company, Arista, before signing with RCA. The wife and mother of two has still experienced massive success with music that's more defined as pop and rock, and media outlets confirm she rarely performs the R&B-inspired songs from her debut album that put her on the map. So can Pink be described as a culture vulture? Or in other words, is she guilty of cultural appropriation? Or is it the responsibility of consumers like us to stop accepting artists like Pink simply because they can hit a high note, wear cornrows, and can dance on beat? Let us know your thoughts, and thanks for watching RRG.